Hi, and thank you so much for watching. Today we will continue from where we left off in the previous video, where Daniel described a vision in which two saints were discussing a period of 2300 days that would end when both the sanctuary and host would be trampled underfoot. We also looked at the evidence from God's word showing us what happens at the end of the 2300 day period, which leads to the return of Israel's Messiah and their 1260 day protection in the wilderness. If you have not seen the first video in this series yet, please watch part 1 first before continuing with this video as the information shared in part 1 is essential for understanding what will be shared in this video. Also, please note that I am sharing my understanding of God's word with you and I could be wrong because I am not perfect and I do not know the future. So study this for yourself and see what the Holy Spirit reveals to you in this regard. In this video, we will look at another peculiar passage in which Gabriel speaks to Daniel about the same 2300 day period, but where the focus is on the start of this period and where Gabriel addresses those who are considered wise. Gabriel mentions two different points on the timeline which occur well before the end of this period. So let's get right into it and see what Gabriel told Daniel about information that would be unsealed in the time of the end. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. In this passage, Gabriel shares very important points with Daniel that require our attention. Firstly, Gabriel states that the information shared would remain sealed until the time of the end. Recognizing the absolute truth of God's word as discussed in part 1 of this series, we understand that anyone attempting to interpret Gabriel's word before the appointed time would arrive at incorrect conclusions. Secondly, Gabriel informs Daniel that those who are wise living when these secrets are revealed will comprehend his words. Gabriel reminds Daniel of the events associated with the disruption of the normal order and the establishment of an abomination that causes emptiness, as witnessed in the discussion between the two saints in chapter 8. However, Gabriel introduces two new points on the 2300 day timeline that evidently apply to the wise at the time of the end and occur before the period's conclusion. Additionally, while not explicitly mentioned by Gabriel, those who grasp this message become aware of something significant. When Gabriel provides specific day counts, he implies that the wise understanding his words will be capable of calculating these points on the timeline from the beginning. Thus, they would be in a position to know the precise star date of the 2300 day period to count to the 1290th day and the 1335th day. This realization necessitates unlocking the mystery of Gabriel's message between the start of the 2300 day period and the 1290th day for God's word to hold true. I believe we currently exist within this time frame where the understanding of Gabriel's words is granted to the wise. This comprehension is critical because traditional interpretations of Gabriel's message revolved around the explanation of a rebuilt third temple in Israel, where the abomination causing desolation would be placed. While this understanding may hold validity, it only comes into play near the end of the 2300 day period, when the Antichrist has already been revealed, assumes global rule, and deceives Israel into perceiving him as their true Messiah by reconstructing a physical third temple for the resumption of sacrificial services. This understanding cannot apply to the wise at the period's start, as God's word indicate that the wise serve as a restraining force against the Antichrist, preventing his revelation and constructing of a physical third temple while they remain on earth. In light of this, I believe God's word specifically addresses the wise regarding Gabriel's message, and enables us to unlock the mystery in the current era. 
The keys to deciphering this message can be found in the following passages. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. The temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul explains that our bodies function as temples for the Holy Spirit, emphasizing that they have been purchased at a price and no longer belong to us. In 1 Corinthians 3, we learn that it is possible to defile our bodies, and there are consequences associated with such defilement. Additionally, in our exploration of the harvest and temple models, we have discovered that the third portion of God's faith harvest, and the third portion of the temple, which is known as the outer court, is destined for destruction, as the only means to maintain its holiness according to the instructions in Leviticus 27. Revelation 6 and 20 clearly demonstrates the destruction of these portions as they relate to our bodily temples. Understanding how our bodies become the temple or dwelling of the Holy Spirit. These passages that we have just considered shed an entire new light on the following parable. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In this parable, Jesus discusses the good man of the house. While it has traditionally been understood to refer to Jesus as being the master of the house, there is another perspective worth considering. If we acknowledge that our bodies are temples for the Holy Spirit, purchased at a price, and no longer belong to us, we also recognize our responsibility as caretakers or householders in the owner's absence of these temples. In many parables, the owner's servants are evaluated based on their actions during his absence. When we explore the potential meanings of the term good man of the house in Greek, It encompasses the idea of the householder or caretaker responsible for looking after the house in the owner's absence. This interpretation aligns well with the concept that Jesus, existing outside of time and space, would never be caught off guard by an enemy attempting to breach his house. It is we who must remain vigilant and ensure that our houses or our bodies are not infiltrated by the enemy. This understanding sheds light on the events that unfolded in the world over the past three years and supplies us with the connection to Gabriel's message that was required to unlock the mystery. Revelation 16 further expands on the theme of watching in this regard. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man.
When we examine Jesus' instruction in Luke 21 about being watchful and prayerful, it has traditionally been interpreted as vigilance for the Lord's return, and not particularly focused on the enemy's actions. Based on the information we have discussed, I believe that in our present time, these instructions are even more applicable to remaining vigilant against the enemy, ensuring that our bodies, which serve as temples for the Holy Spirit, are not breached or defiled. Jesus' call to be watchful and prayerful encompasses both aspects, staying attentive to the signs of his return and also safeguarding against the enemy's schemes to infiltrate and defile our bodies. God's word tells us that the enemy seeks to defile our bodies by introducing an abomination that allows him to gain control over our dwellings, presenting himself as the master of that abode. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In Daniel chapter 2 there is a further clue highlighting the importance of our bodies in the end times, and the means by which the enemy will seek to defile our temples. This clue can be found in Daniel 2 verse 43, where Daniel explains to Nebuchadnezzar, that the mixture of iron and clay observed in the statue's feet represents the blending of human and non-human seeds. In contemporary terms, this is understood as the manipulation or splicing of human DNA with foreign and non-human elements, pointing to the contamination of God's temple in terms of our bodies that were created after His image and God's name found written as number sequences on every original and unmodified human DNA molecule. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. If we contemplate Paul's understanding of our bodies serving as temples of God, and the idea of splicing human DNA with non-human elements, as a transgression leading to an abomination within our bodies that causes an emptiness, and how this correlates to Gabriel's mention of an abomination, it becomes very apparent where this is leading. According to Paul's perspective of our bodies being temples to the Holy Spirit, the abomination that causes desolation would involve the introduction of something into the bodies of those who have already become temples of God, resulting in the defilement of that temple and the subsequent departure of the Holy Spirit, rendering it empty. A similar pattern is seen in the Bible, where the glory of God once resided in Solomon's temple, but departed from it due to Israel's practice of idolatry, never to return to a physical building again. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. If we have a biblical model for something, we should understand that God's indwelling glory can also depart from our bodies if our bodies are defiled by transforming them into dwellings that are no longer suitable for the Holy Spirit. Jesus also indicated that in the end times it will be similar to the days of Noah where the corruption of flesh on the earth led to God's judgment and the destruction that occurred. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. If we apply Paul's interpretation of our bodies serving as temples for the Holy Spirit to the parable of the ten virgins, the oil mentioned in this parable would then symbolize the presence of the Holy Spirit within believers whose bodies remain undefiled at the time of the bridegroom's return. The separation of the wise and foolish virgins corresponds to those who safeguarded their houses, keeping oil in their vessels, and those who allowed the enemy to enter their dwellings, no longer being vessels fit for the oil of the Holy Spirit. Now there are several interpretations of this parable that I believe are all valid, but if this interpretation is correct, Gabriel's explanation to Daniel in chapter 12, where he addresses the wise, finds a very specific and notable fulfillment in recent history. On March 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared a global emergency, disrupting the previous order that existed in the world. Since that day, life has not returned to its former state, and it is widely acknowledged as a pivotal moment in world history. For those whose hope does not lie in our Redeemer, 
They are still asking when things will return to normal, even though they inadvertently acknowledge that March 11, 2020 was the day everything changed never to return to the former. This event is also linked to the introduction of an abomination that involves the splicing of human DNA with non-human elements, resulting in spiritual emptiness for those whose bodies have been defiled. Notably, the commencement of medical trials for these substances administered through injections began on March 16, 2020, just five days after the disruption of the normal order, emphasizing the words of Gabriel to the wise and marking the start of the 2300-day period very clearly. The fact that medical trials could begin so swiftly after the global emergency declaration implies that those orchestrating these actions were following a predetermined schedule, as elucidated by the Book of Daniel. The alignment of media actions with regards to the truth since March 11, 2020, further supports the events described in Daniel 8. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Not only can we clearly see the date on which the normal daily order ended, and this being connected to an abomination being set up just five days later, but since March 11th, the truth has been suppressed to a degree that the world has never seen before, just as shown to us in Daniel 8. On March 26, 2020, Microsoft was granted a patent for a cryptocurrency system based on human body activity, which is connected to the aforementioned abomination by the patent number. This patent bears the number associated with the beast mentioned in the book of Revelation, and that number is 666. Additionally, on March 18th, 2020, former President Trump announced the deployment of two hospital ships named Mercy and Comfort, with Trump personally kissing Comfort goodbye on March 28th, as he expressed in his own words. I can now announce something that I think is incredible, what they've done in the Navy, uh, because the incredible naval hospital ship, the USNS Comfort, which is incredible, actually, when you see it inside, will be underway to New York City on Saturday. So it's going to be leaving on Saturday rather than three weeks from now. They uh, did the maintenance quickly, and it was going to be there for quite a while longer, another three or four weeks. And uh, it should be arriving. I told the governor 20 minutes ago, Governor Cuomo, that the ship will be arriving at New York Harbor on Monday. I think I'm going to go out and uh, I'll kiss it goodbye. I'll go, I'll go to, uh, it's in Virginia, as you know, and I will go and uh, we'll be waving together because I suspect the media will be following. John, are you going to be following? Maybe. You I never know, huh? Effort, sir. It's a very important vessel. Great ship. It's a great vessel, is right. Since March 11, 2020, the world has witnessed a shift in the availability of comfort and mercy that was previously experienced. This period also saw the enforcement of measures such as the use of face masks, which had a massive psychological impact on people around the world, instilling fear and symbolizing the restriction placed on speaking the truth in public. This was followed by intolerance towards sharing opinions freely that deviated from the narrative on platforms that were once open to the truth. All these events are, in my opinion, clearly linked to the events described in the book of Daniel and Revelation. And looking back with the advantage of having this understanding, we are provided with a precise starting point for the 2300-day period, the first phase of which Jesus referred to as the beginning of sorrows. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. If March 11, 2020 marks the start of the 2300-day period, what follows next is 1,290 days, which Jesus tells his disciples is not the end yet. The fact that Gabriel gives an exact count from the start once again emphasizes that the start of this period 
would become known to those who live in the end times. So what do the 1290 days represent? This represents the beginning of God's judgment over the world, but a judgment that is first intended for testing those of his own house. Gabriel mentions this testing and judgment in particular when explaining it to Daniel. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. This is confirmed for us in 1 Peter chapter 4, showing us clearly that judgment begins with the house of God. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? As we examine Gabriel's description of God's judgment or testing upon his own house, it becomes evident that those who are purified, tested, and made white are individuals who belong to God's house and who pass the test. I am also of the opinion that the beginning of sorrows is also linked to the release of the four horsemen of Revelation, which are referred to as the host in Daniel. The white horse was released on March 11, 2020, while the red horse was released on February 24, 2022, shortly after Purim, aligning with the description in Zechariah chapter 1, when Russia's invasion of Ukraine began leading to a prolonged conflict that will eventually result in peace being removed from the earth. The world can also observe how the black horse rider has been manifested through various intentional environmental disasters, which had a notable start in early February of 2023. This started off in the form of train derailments and industrial fires that released very harmful substances into the environment that will negatively impact food production and human health in the foreseeable future. I have a feeling that the pale horse will be released once Satan is confined to the earth, and this will only happen after the rapture of the church. So what happens on day 1290? I can only speculate, but we can seek insight from God's word by looking at repeating patterns. If March 11, 2020 marked day 1 of the 2300 day period during which the first phase of this period would be for the testing and purification of God's church, Day 1290 falls on September 22, 2023. This would signify the last day of God's testing his own before the period known as the beginning of sorrows ends and the time of the end begins. With the available information, it is clear to see that September 23, 2023 represents the midnight cry mentioned in the parable of the ten virgins. This is likely the time when the wise who passed the test will join the bridegroom for the wedding. If you have watched my channel for some time, you will know that September 23rd was the date on which the Revelation 12 sign was fulfilled in 2017, and also the reason why I started this channel. September 23rd holds extreme prominence in predictive programming, suggesting that the enemy is very aware of what to expect on this day and finds it amusing to share this date openly with the world, knowing that many will see it but not understand its meaning. The fact that March 11, 2020 marks a pivotal point in world history that clearly aligns with the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation, and our enemy announcing through predictive programming a date that just happens to be exactly 1290 days after the start of this very prophetic period, should have every person who is watching for the Lord's return jump up and down with excitement. There will be many who encounter a closed door on this day, thinking they would be part of the wedding, but discovering that they lacked oil in their vessels, and did not embrace the truth of God's word, or were deceived by the enemy. However, two promises from God's word are given to them, one from Gabriel, and one from Jesus as follows. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door, and knock. 
If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. Notice how Jesus addresses those who hear him knocking at the door after the wedding. They are the ones who did not watch their garments, and who are rebuked and chastened by the Lord, and yet they are still loved and desired by the bridegroom. In Daniel 12, Gabriel points to those who wait until the 1335th day, who will receive a blessing, and we have a pattern for this from God's word, that tells us what this is for and what to expect. In Luke chapter 12, we see servants awaiting their Lord, specifically when he returns from the wedding and knocks on their doors. They are told to ensure that their loins are girded and their lights are burning when they meet him on his return. The question that immediately comes to mind when I read these words in light of what we have considered is this. How would these servants whose temples were defiled and who are no longer vessels that are fit for the oil of the Holy Spirit be found with their lights burning at the bridegroom's return from the wedding? Surely the fact that their lights are burning would indicate that they are vessels that can hold oil once again. This can, in my opinion, be understood by Jesus' work on the earth after his death and resurrection which served as the former reign over the early harvest, a pattern that we are told to expect to repeat before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. So just as Jesus and those who were raised to life with him were glorified and then appeared to those in Jerusalem for forty days after his resurrection and performed many miracles, so too will those who will be raptured appear to those who are left behind after the rapture. During Jesus' time those forty days served as the early rains, preparing those in Jerusalem for the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the subsequent persecution of the church. In our case, it is clear to see that our Heavenly Father intends to bring those who have allowed their bodies to be defiled back to Him. I believe that the period between the 1290th day and the 1335th day will see those who were glorified in the rapture return to the earth to heal those whose bodies were defiled and to share God's truth with them and to ensure that their lights are burning when the bridegroom returns. This would allow those who are without oil to receive the oil of the Holy Spirit anew when it is poured out over them as a blessing on day 1335. If we consider the pattern provided for us in God's word, this period between 1290 and 1335 days will represent the time of the latter rain that will prepare the final portion of God's faith harvest for the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit, before the final persecution starts. This will then be followed by severe persecution and the complete destruction of God's remaining church on the earth by the Antichrist, and those who follow him, the last of which would be the two witnesses after they have completed their testimony. From the following passage, it is clear that those who will be raptured will be few, and those who are left behind will be many. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The period between day 1335 and day 2300 marks the time when the outer court will be trampled underfoot and when the two witnesses will testify. In the previous video we discussed why this period is shortened and instead of lasting for 1260 days or 42 months that are assigned in Revelation 11, it appears to be shortened to only 965 days until the end of the 2300 day period is reached. Based on this interpretation, we consider March 11th, 2020 as the starting point of the 2300 day period. September 22nd, 2023 would be the day when God's testing of his church ends. And September 23rd would be the day when the restrainer is removed and the heavenly wedding between the bridegroom and the bride occurs. On this day, our bridegroom will remove his bride from the world and Satan will be cast out of heaven to be confined to the earth. This event may bring darkness over the world for a period of possibly three days, which will serve as the sign of Jonah 
for this generation as indicated by Jesus in the following passages. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. These passages indicate that there will be a visible celestial event that the world will witness that may involve Jupiter as understood from Revelation 12. And it is also possible that the world may go through a period of darkness similar to what Jonah and Jesus experienced, lasting for three days in each case. Whether those who will be raptured will also experience this darkness remains uncertain, but we can find our answers regarding this question in God's word. The first thing we observe is that darkness is associated with events happening outside the door once it is shut, and the unprofitable servant is cast out into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the wise virgins enter the marriage with the bridegroom and the door is shut, the foolish find themselves outside without lamps that are lit and in darkness given that this happens at midnight. Notably, the wise virgins and the good servants did not have to endure any darkness in these parables. So it stands to reason that their removal from the earth would bring about the darkness that is spoken of. Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus also clearly states that those who follow him are the light of the world. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Based on these passages, it seems that the world can only experience the sign of Jonah, which involves three days of darkness, and possible other visible heavenly signs if our Heavenly Father first removes His light from the world. Based on this biblical evidence, I have to conclude that the rapture would occur at the beginning of this period of darkness. This would mark the marriage of the bridegroom with his bride in heaven, while the world endures Satan's arrival on the earth after being cast down from heaven. Interestingly, the man who is found without a wedding garment at the wedding is only thrown out of heaven once the guests have already arrived. This man, of course, can only be Satan, who currently has access to heaven and who stands before the throne of God and accuses us day and night. He would certainly be seen as an imposter in heaven when the marriage of the bridegroom commences. This would then further support an understanding of darkness following the rapture. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Following the rapture and the three days of darkness, there will be a period of approximately forty days during which the glorified believers who are united with the bridegroom 
will very likely serve as the latter rain upon the final portion of God's faith harvest. On November 6th, 2023, day 1335 would be reached and will likely involve the second outpouring of God's Spirit over the final portion of His faith harvest after being restored by the latter rain. This will mark the start of the final persecution of the church by the Antichrist and this will continue until the time when the two witnesses lay down their lives, three and a half days before the end of the 2300 day period. And this will mark the completion of the sanctuary being trampled underfoot. During this time, the world will be expected to worship the Antichrist and to accept his mark in their bodies, if they want to live or face beheading. In the three and a half days that follow the deaths of the two witnesses, the remnant of Israel will be the enemy's focus, and the events that occur in the world during those three and a half days will have them call out to their true Messiah, who will then reveal himself to them, as he saves them from assured destruction and they enter a period of protection in the wilderness that will last for 1260 days. If this timeline is correct, the two witnesses' testimony will end on June 24, 2026, when the last believers who refuse to worship the Antichrist have been put to death and the two witnesses lay down their lives after having emptied the oil out of themselves. Three and a half days later, Jesus returns for Israel. At this time the first fruits of the wheat harvest are presented to him, when the 144,000 is resurrected, and these of course represent the Hebrew babies that were murdered during the times of Moses and Jesus. This is the only group of Hebrew males that fit the description provided in the book of Revelation. All of them are from the tribes of Israel. None of them have ever told a lie in their lives, meaning that their lives were ended before they could speak properly, and none of them were ever defiled by women. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. If this understanding is correct, Jesus' second coming will then occur on June 28th of 2026 and the end of Israel's protection in the wilderness will occur on December 9th, 2029. This, in short, is the timeline that would seem to be presented to us in God's word by unsealing Gabriel's message to Daniel. I know there may be many questions that I did not touch on in this explanation, but I plan to do a follow-up video or two or three in which I will address some of the questions that have already been asked. So if something is unclear to you, or if you have specific questions about the explanation provided, Please post your question in the comment section and I will do my best to address them in follow-up videos. I hope this will bless you as it blessed me to share this with you. Once again, remember that I am fallible and my interpretation may be wrong, but going by what we've seen in the world and by the evidence that we have, I believe the chances for an accurate interpretation is pretty good. Until next time, God bless. Thank you.